Welcome to Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. A world where coming in second place is not an option, but where principle-centered winning is the only approach. Good morning and welcome to Government Contracting Weekly. I'm Jim McCarthy, the owner of Key Solutions and the host of this show. Government Contracting Weekly is all about the winning of government contracts, and for the most part, that's not just going to happen without some very skillful negotiations as a critical part of the process. Joining me today to probe the subject of negotiations are three highly regarded contracting leaders from both the public and the private sector, all of whom will also happen to be members of the NCMA Board of Advisors. First, let's meet uh, Dan Kane, the Director of the Office of Acquisitions and Grants Management within the Centers for Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, Dan, welcome. Thank welcome you for having very me. Very much. Glad, glad you're here. In this role, uh, Daniel is the head of the contracting activity and, uh, and chief grants management official for the uh, CMS. So welcome. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Rita Wells, a senior acquisition executive with Suntiva. Uh, prior to Rita's work in the private sector, she also served for a number of years with both the Department of Defense and the Department of Transportation. Good morning, Rita. Thank you for, for inviting me. Welcome, welcome very much. And last but not least, welcome to John Lyle, a member of the Senior Executive Service, who is also the Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary for Contracting for the headquarters of the U.S. Air Force. And John assists the Deputy Assistant Secretary in all aspects of contracting related to the acquisition of weapon systems, logistics support, materiel, and services for the Air Force. So good morning to you, John. Good morning to you, Jim. Thanks okay. for having me. So uh, panel, as always, we have a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. So my first question is that in the um, contracting side, we hear about something called discussions and something called negotiations. The first question uh, would be for you, Dan. How are they different? Well, I'm not sure there's a, a, a fine line. There's a fine line between what discussions are and what negotiations are. I think when you think about negotiations, you have to think about uh, a competitive environment versus a contract's already awarded, and you maybe need to negotiate a change order. So the regulations require discussions, and in a competitive environment, when there are significant weaknesses in a contractor's proposal. Mm -hmm. And so we spend a lot of time having discussions about whatever those significant are. So if I understand are. then, discussions tend to be pre-award and negotiations are post-award. Is that, is that correct? Well, is that, is that? from my perspective yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the Air Force, yeah. and uh, I know that uh, Dan is also government, and, and I agree with what Dan is saying as far as the distinction between negotiations and discussions and everything, but in a competitive environment, if there's clarifications, mm -hmm. we don't call those discussions. We make a distinction that we can have those and not really call them discussions. It's a, it's, a, it's a fine legal mm -hmm. interpretation, but as far as negotiations, that could be uh, either before award or after award, especially in a non-competitive environment. Mm -hmm. Negotiations, that's when you when you say the word negotiations, that's what I kind of lock in on is a non-competitive non environment. Post-award, yes? Pre-award and post-award. Okay. Yeah. okay, well that's good. Rita, um, you know, I know you've been on both sides, both the government and, and industry, and so I think that's a very valuable perspective for us. But what, what makes the government decide in um, acquisition A it's going to go to negotiations and acquisition B it's going to go right to award, say, on the basis of the initial proposal? What, what kind of goes into the equation? Well, I think it just depends upon the circumstances involved in that, that specific acquisition. If there is adequate competition, if if there are no outstanding issues, mm -hmm. then there really may not be anything left to negotiate, mm -hmm. to have discussions on. And um, in another situation, it might be that there are some areas where the government would like to enter into discussions with some of the, the, the um, bidders, the right. offerors, right. And uh, if they're going to have discussions with one in the competitive range, then they should have discussions with all. Mm -hmm. And so it really depends on the circumstances. The circumstances. You know, we, we do a lot of uh, supporting uh, orals team for oral presentations. And I think every time that I can remember, the contracting offer has always sort of warned the contractors that these, this question and answer period do not constitute discussions. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, what, what, why don't they constitute discussions? Well, I think that in the uh, when, you know oral presentations is part of the proposal process, 
by the way, we've used that a lot, and I think that's a, a nice solution to uh, trying to move things along quicker in the acquisition process. Um, so those, dis those uh, oral discussions are more about trying to understand the proposal, and then of course the government will go back and have discussions internally amongst yourselves and try to understand now what is it that we want to talk with them about and get clarification on or talk about their weaknesses. <coughs> And now that we have a position, by the way, we spoke with many companies and we're maybe narrowed it down to these two or three. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think there's a difference. I see. I okay. would agree with Dan, but I just mm -hmm. wanted to just point out one other clarification on the award without discussions. Uh -huh. We include that in all of our solicitations, the clause that we, we reserve the right, reserve to, the do right that. to do that. Yeah. However, uh, we rarely do that anymore because when we do that, we're more susceptible to protest. And uh, I think that we find out about ambiguities and problems after award that way, especially on complicated, complex mm -hmm. weapon system acquisitions. It's not advisable to award without discussion because then you get into problems after award where the offerer might say, well, that's not what I meant. That's the way we interpret it, and it could be an incorrect interpretation. So it's better to go through the process right. on these major weapons. Systems. Is it a fair inference to make that if you've been asked to go to negotiations that you are the apparent awardee anyway? Is that, is that fair? No, I no. think that uh, after competitive range, depending on you know the companies and the proposals you have and how they rack and stack up, mm -hmm. uh, we may have negotiations with one company in the competitive range, or we may have negotiations with multiple. I would think most of the time we're having negotiations with multiple companies. And why 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 say multiple companies instead of just the one uh, the one leader or the one that looks best? Why why are you doing? Uh, multiple things. Because we need to understand, we need to have those negotiations and discussions to better understand what is in their proposal and after having them, having a better understanding, we might uh, change our mind and rack and stack the proposals differently. Okay. It also provides an opportunity for the contractor to submit a revised proposal after negotiations after or negotiations. as a result of negotiations mm -hmm. and it wouldn't really be fair to give one one offeror that opportunity and not give that opportunity to other offerors within the competitive range. So we're definitely talking about the context of competitive, competitive acquisitions here right. uh, uh, with uh, discussions yeah. and everything and yeah. as Dan said and Rita pointed out as well from the industry side uh, it would not be fair uh, <clears throat> for the government to say well this is the apparent winner so we're not going to worry about the other offers mm -hmm. because as Rita said when you get to the point of uh, final proposal revision and the request for that an offer that may not have the best proposal could end up having the best proposal after that process after that discussion okay. process. Well we have a little bit under a minute left before we uh, <coughs> go to a break here but if you're then um, n negotiating with more than one company w more than one offer war could there be a tendency uh, for leveling to occur or to pit one contractor against the other contractor? Is that, and is maybe is that the intention that the government wants the best deal? So if they're negotiating with several companies, that gives them some leverage. What's, what's your thought on that? I think yeah. we're always careful not to uh, have leveling within the, the proposals. I mean, every offer is different. Each contractor has their own approach, their own way of going about uh, doing the work, the service that we're procuring. The really intent of the negotiations is to understand a little bit better about approach A, B, and C as opposed to trying to bring them all into alignment as to sort of how we would like the work to be done because at the end of the day the contractor is doing the work and we want them to do the work and be successful. Okay, well we're going to step away for just a second and when we come back I'd like to get into what's it take to get ready for negotiations. I suspect they just don't happen. So we'll be right back. So did we win that government contract? We did. And? And now we've got to deal with the regulatory hurdles. <laughs> well, good luck with that. When the government's your client, you need to play by their rules. Oh, and the rules change more than you think. Exactly. We need someone who's done this before. Plus, it's complicated, so we're going with BDO. BDO? Hmm. People who know government contracting know BDO. Working in contract management is a complex job. Creating, executing, managing contracts. It's an ever-changing world, and our members share the same challenges. At the National Contract Management Association, we know this business, gathering the best minds in our field, furthering your career by providing knowledge and training. Together, we've figured it out.
Okay, we're back here talking about negotiations. I want to ask this question of Rita Wells because you've been on both sides, but here I'd like to get the perspective from the government side for a minute. I'm guessing, I don't know, but that the government just doesn't walk in on the day of negotiations and wing it. It must do something. What, what happens behind the scenes? Uh, yes, and again, it depends on the dollar amount and the complexity of the acquisition, but there usually is a requirement on the government side to prepare some kind of a pre-negotiation uh, document, a business clearance document or a pre-negotiation memorandum, and it may have to be briefed to higher levels and approved by higher levels mm -hmm. and coordinated with, with uh, the program and uh, so it, often legal. Is that sort of like the strategy, this is what the government wants it's, to accomplish? It's or? a very comprehensive mm -hmm. document. It really starts from day one with identification of the requirement and um, and it gives all of the information about when the RFP was issued, the number of offers that were offers that were received, mm -hmm. and how many were included in the competitive mm -hmm. range. Why there is a need for discussions for mm -hmm. negotiation. It's all laid out in it's writing. It's all laid out. It, there will be a segment that discusses the technical evaluation and then also a pricing section, uh -huh. and all of that leads to uh, objectives okay. for the negotiation. And I think it's important to realize that price is very important, but price is not always the primary objective. So we're told, by the way, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and there are many cases yeah, where there are other factors that are involved. Okay, so there's this written document. Yes. It's, maybe it's passed up the chain. Now you walk into the room. So, Dan, I'll ask you this question. Um, how much latitude does the negotiating team have on the government side to, let's say, vary from that document? Or, or oh, maybe they have no latitude. I don't know. Right. So, first, let me say the contracting yeah. officer is, is almost like the orchestrator. Uh -huh. um, you know, before they go in and establish that position, they have to rely on uh, technical uh, panels, business panels, maybe attorneys, maybe cost price analysts, auditors. They have to bring all that together before they walk in the room. Um, and they need to have the right people with them. Uh, the contracting officer is in charge of the discussions, mm -hmm. um, but most of the times before they walk into the room, the government uh, will get together, making sure we have all the right players, making sure we're all on the same page about where there's give and take and understanding of the requirements, mm -hmm. and to ensure that uh, discussions are successful on both sides. But if, if the discussions are, say, are proceeding in good faith from both sides, and there's a point where it's not exactly on your sheet, so to speak, does, is the, or, are the contracting officers' hands tied in such a situation, or can they, uh, you know, wing it? No, there's wide latitude within the government, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Jim, for the contracting officer to uh, to react accordingly. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though, as Rita said, there's an objective position approved, mm -hmm. usually by a senior person within the Air Force, we centralize that business clearance process. So anything over 500 million in a non-competitive environment is approved f for the business clearance at our level mm -hmm. within the Air Force, and that would be General Blake and I would approve those. Okay. And then it would go on to, if it's over 500 million, go on to Shea Assad as the Director of Defense Pricing. So that's a very formalized process, and the contracting officer is in charge, but there's a variety, a wide variety of government agencies that within the Department of Defense, especially, mm -hmm. that help prepare for those negotiations. Okay. For, for any, 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 all, of, or all of you, excuse me, uh, so you have these set of objectives. What do these objectives tend to be? Is it, okay, our job is to go in there and ring, extract the last ounce of blood from that contractor, or is it uh, to do to adjust the terms and conditions? What what are typical negotiations that are, uh, you know, objectives that are that are put forth? So uh, there's there's. I like to think of mission objectives, so you have a scope of work, you have requirements. I think the team needs to understand on both sides what is it that the, how this contract is going to help the mission of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and you're talking about money, but really at the end of the day you're talking about requirements. Yeah. So I think the contracting officer has flexibility in how those re requirements are achieved by the contractor at the end of the day. Well, but is one of the objectives to seek a uh, a win-win with the contractor, or frankly, the government isn't interested in win-win. They're safeguarding the taxpayers. The What's government is trying to yeah. achieve a fair and reasonable price, yeah. and that yes. doesn't necessarily mean the lowest price, but a fair right. and reasonable price for what the requirement is. Right. And the requirement could have unique characteristics if it's an expedited delivery schedule, if it's something in a hazardous environment, if it is a unique technology mm -hmm. that's not really been put out there before. So there are mm -hmm. lots of things that mm -hmm. go into that whole assessment of what is a fair and reasonable price. 
So it's not that the government is trying to squeeze the last ounce or the, <laughs> last, the last penny yeah. out of the contractor. It's that they're really trying to get a fair and reasonable price and, and for you, the requirement. You know that because you've been on both sides of the aisle, yes. so to speak. Okay, we're going to step away again. When we come back, we're going to continue a couple threads of this conversation. We'll be right back. Hi, everyone. My name is Elaine Rogers, and I'm the president of the USO of Metropolitan Washington. I'd like to take the opportunity to tell you about a great holiday program we have that brings cheer and joy to the children of our local service members and their families living in the Washington, Baltimore area. Project USO ELF is a program that gives you the opportunity to be an ELF to a military child during the holiday season. These gifts will be made up of toys taken from the personal wish lists of the children of our nation's military heroes. What better time to say thank you to our local service members and their families than during the holiday season. Please help us put smiles on the faces of our military children by serving as an elf this year. Registration is so easy. To learn more about Project USO ELF and other USO Metro holiday programs, visit usometro.org slash holiday. Thank you for your support of our troops and their families. And from all of us at the USO of Metropolitan Washington, happy holidays. Okay, welcome back. We're talking about negotiations between government and contractors, and this has been a very interesting panel. I'd like to talk about the, uh, we, we said how the objectives are laid out before you ever walk into the room. What's the typical composition of a negotiating team from the government? I know it varies, but typically, what is it? I'll go first, if you'd like, uh, and I'm sure Dan Arita will have some comments on it, but as far as from an Air Force, the Department of Defense, the contracting officer is the quarterback, since we're in football season, I'll use that analogy, mm -hmm. and the rest of the teammates that are there, as far as the engineer, will provide a technical evaluation, and I'm talking about the context of a non-competitive negotiation and discussion when it's sole source and not competitive. Right. But uh, the contracting officer is the quarterback, the, the engineer will provide a technical evaluation, the program manager supports because he's uh, responsible for the overall cost schedule and performance of that particular program. Mm -hmm. But the contracting officer is the only one that has the authority to represent the government, to have those discussions, negotiations, and then ultimately sign the contract. Right. So there's a lot of people that, were, that are very much involved okay. and, and contribute. So given that there are a lot of people, and let's just talk about it in a competitive environment, okay, for a minute. What type of skills uh, does the government look for on its side of the table f to represent the government in negotiations with a contractor? What, what, who makes the best negotiator? I guess I, I, I think the contracting officer, one of the most important things, they need to have just awareness. Awareness of you know, the emotion of the negotiation, what the issues are, uh, the technical issues, the cost issues, the awareness that what the contractor might want to achieve before they go into negotiations. They also need to have patience. They need to have patience to be able to get through the hurdles. In every negotiation, there's usually controversy and hurdles, and, and having patience in order to get over those hurdles is important. Right. Okay, well, I know this never happens in your respective agencies, but is there ever gaming on the side of the government? Like they say, okay, Joe, we want you to be the, the, the bad cop, and Susie, we want you to be the good cop. Does that, that kind of thing happen in, from the government side? I think it does once in a while. If there is a, a huge difference, we're a, in a non-competitive environment, and I, I keep going back to that because that's where we have the big problems in negotiations. The competitive environment from a government point of view, we're in the driver's seat. And we pretty much dictate what the terms are and everything. And industry either plays or they don't play. Mm -hmm. But in a non-competitive environment, if we get a proposal that's well, sometimes we call them ridiculous proposals because they're ridiculously high a bit compared to what the requirement is and what the risk is. That could set up to a very interesting type of uh, negotiation. We may have to, in fact, have some role playing uh, to get through that. Oh, okay, so that maybe does it's all kind of pre-planned then, I guess, in one sense. That's very interesting. Yeah. Now, we, we all know that the times have been different, uh, maybe tough, for government contractors and government the last couple of years. Does that tend to bleed over into negotiations? In other words, are, they, are negotiations more um, onerous now than they used to be? Or, or in fact, or is everybody more compliant because they just want to get an agreement? I think negotiations aren't easier or harder. I just think they're different. 
over the last several years. Uh, you know, it's technical issues, cost issues, but we have other issues, also organizational conflict of interest. We have to have severe uh, discussions about past performance so we understand what the issues were if some there was a, a significant weakness in a past performance issue. Um, and so they're just, you know, different okay. negotiations than they've been over the last 10 years. Different or, then, maybe, okay. So Rita, now that I, you know, we know that you've been on both the government and the contractor side, it occurs to me in a competitive environment, in fact, John, you just mentioned it, that negotiations generally occur between relative equals, but when you have the government with the contract and the contractor seeking it, is that negotiations or is it just dictation? You're going to do this. It is two parties coming together trying to to reach a, a mutually <coughs> a, agreeable objective. Yes. And um, rarely have I seen the government strong arm a contractor. There, and and um, as John said, there are some situations where it appears that a contractor, especially in a non-competitive environment, yeah. uh, seems to have the, the upper hand. Mm -hmm. So uh, part of the strategy of preparing for negotiations is to identify strengths, weaknesses, vulnerabilities, opportunities, alternatives, mm -hmm. and to have a plan for what you're going to do as a contract negotiator depending upon the course of the negotiations. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I yeah, uh, add do. to what Rita's yeah. saying there? From the government point of view, we don't want to put any industry or business partner out of business. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we want industry to have a fair and reasonable price, and that's what we've mentioned mm -hmm. already. But sometimes it doesn't appear that way because the government only has so much funding, or what our interpretation of the requirement is is a certain way that industry may be misinterpreting. And that's where we get into those clarifications that we have to talk about in a competitive environment. Is it been your experience, your collective experience, that before going into <coughs> negotiations, do you tell the contractor, here are the five points we want to discuss so that they have a chance to think about it? Yeah. Who sends an agenda? Does yeah. that happen? An okay. agenda, and in a competitive environment, um, unfortunately, due to GAO protests and having to document the following, we talked about documentation a little bit, uh, we'll normally send written questions to them and maybe even get written responses before we actually sit down at the table. We have less than 30 seconds. Can the contractor put things on the table in advance so that the government can think about it? Here's the things we sure. want to When we send the, uh, the government uh, person, excuse me, when the government sends industry the agenda, they often add things that they want to talk about. So yeah. it's, a, it's a give and take. It's two parties. Two parties. Okay, well, we thank you very much. We're going to step away again. We'll be right back. It's no surprise to any of you that social media has impacted virtually every aspect of our personal lives. Sure, you can say there are both pluses and minuses, but this is the world we live in, and absent a move to a deserted island, there's no getting around it. What is surprising, though, is how some in the government contracting community have not yet fully embraced social media as a business strategy not only to advance your brand, but also to help win and retain business with your federal customers. At Key Solutions, we believe that social media has to be an integral part of your business development plan. We also believe that while this technology is advancing like a high-speed train, you can either jump on board or watch your competition leave you in the dust. If you are a federal contractor looking to integrate a social media strategy into your business, we will be able to help you. Contact us at AOCKeysolutions.com. Panel, before we wrap up this morning's program, I'd like to share with our audience some of my own thoughts that I recently recorded on what I call the telltale signs that your proposal is about to crash and burn. When pursuing a government contract, no company sets out to tilt at windmills or fall down a rabbit hole. Yet we see companies spend valuable time and resources chasing a contract they cannot realistically win. Here are some telltale signs that your proposal is about to crash and burn. Maybe they won't apply to you, but why take the chance? You join the fray too late. You don't know the customer and the customer doesn't know you. Even you are unable to articulate the compelling reasons why your company should be selected. Your proposal is managed by a committee, not a bold leader. Thus, strategic decisions have a half-life of 30 minutes or less. No key personnel are to be found in the war room, and senior management is too busy to get involved meaningfully. Continuing, you know your proposal is in trouble when 
The capture manager and proposal manager are not on the same page. Your proposal manager is unable or unwilling to enforce internal deadlines. You'll find a pair of well-used scissors on a writer's desk. Your kickoff meeting was a waste of time and your daily stand-ups drag on forever. The specter of pride of authorship rears its ugly head. Your company evidences a haphazard approach to RFP compliance. You know danger lies ahead when your proposal contains too many superlatives and too few benefits or proofs. When your document has nothing to sell, no value proposition, and your proposal is about you and your company, not your customer. You find yourself parroting back the statement of work with the PWS. Your focus is on what you will do rather than how it will be done. You are saddled with an ill-equipped review team whose members have not even done their basic homework. So there you have some red flags and warning signs that your proposal is at risk. The good thing about advance notice is that you have time to stop, regroup, redirect, and recommit to doing the right things in the right way. We at Government Contracting Weekly hope you will heed these telltale signs and we're here to help. Contact us at aockeysolutions.com and thank you very much. Okay, we're back. Panel, I've really enjoyed this morning's discussion and I'm sure our audience has taken a lot away from your comments and expertise. I'd especially like to thank the National Contract Management Association, or NCMA, for making three of their distinguished members of their Board of Advisors available to us this morning. Now to our panelists. First, John Lyle, the Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary for Contracting for the headquarters of the U.S. Air Force. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Appreciate Thanks you for being here. Me. Thank you. Next, Rita Wells, a Senior Acquisition Executive with Suntiva. Thank you, Rita. My pleasure. Right. And then lastly, uh, Dan Kane, the Director of the Office of Acquisition and Grants Management within the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Thank you, Dan, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. But most importantly, I want to thank you, our viewers, for once again making Government Contracting Weekly a regular part of your learning regimen. On behalf of all my colleagues at Key Solutions, I'm Jim McCarthy, and I'll see you next week. Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored each week by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. For additional information, comments, questions, or suggestions, please write us at governmentcontractingweekly.com. <laughs>